Uh, welcome everyone, my name is Naomi Brockwell. I am delighted to be sharing the stage with the one and only Arvind O'Brien. I'm also really pleased to be here. This is my first Friedman Conference. I've been living in the States for coming up to seven years now. And when I left, there was nothing like this. So to come here and see such an amazing group of people and see so many great talks and see so much engagement, I mean, it is really inspiring. And it also means that you guys aren't doing too bad a job at communicating the ideas of liberty, that this is growing to such a, a great size. So well done. Uh, Arvinds and I are, of course, going to be talking about communicating ideas. Um, Arvinds is actually, I mean, she is an incredible person. She's been a good friend of mine for many, many years now. And uh, if you look at the way she carries herself on social media, she's like a social media powerhouse. She's someone who doesn't block anyone uh, on her page, who doesn't delete comments, who actively engages discussion about controversial topics, who will actively write blogs and then make controversial co topics to get people to engage and discuss ideas. And uh, she's someone you can learn a lot about. I come at communication from a, a different side of things. I'm a producer in the United States. I've produced feature films for 12 years. I'm currently a TV producer. I was at Fox. Now I'm at Reason TV uh, producing the Stossel Show. And so hopefully between the two of us, you will get an idea of, of some of the things that we think are, in, are important in communicating ideas of liberty. We've basically distilled our ideas down to four major points that we're going to be talking to you about today. And before we go into that, I just want to, to let you know that communication is half the battle. Now, I know the type of people who come to conferences like this, we think that facts are everything. And we think that because logic is on our side, that people will fall to us like fresh fruit from the vine. And it's just not the way it works, unfortunately. Um, Communication is half the battle, and it doesn't matter whether you think you're right, and it doesn't matter whether facts are on your side. If you can't actually communicate those ideas to other people, then the battle is lost. So it is so important to learn how to engage people, how to get people who don't necessarily agree with you to open their minds and to consider other possibilities and other ideas. So without further ado, uh, the first thing that we're going to talk about is telling an individual story. So it, I'll begin with, with that one. Uh, working in, in film, you really, I mean, it, it's so clear in, in film production that telling an individual story is a powerful tool. Now, I, um, I'm, I'm part of the libertarian movement in the United States, and I see so many organizations doing amazing work and writing these white papers based on so much research and amazing journalism and, and their white papers. And who's going to read them, you know? You have these amazing people here today who are doing the same thing, who just have put together these great packages of, of dense information. And, you know, if people would just read it, then perhaps people would understand why freedom is important, why liberty is important. And... Um, and what you learn when you make a film is that, I mean, you don't go into the filmmaking process saying, oh, well, I'm going to tell a story about eight million people. Because no, I mean, people can't connect with that at all. People can't actually even comprehend large numbers like that. So statistics can be powerful ammunition in a discussion, but that's not the engaging way to tell a story. If you choose one of those people and you tell a compelling story about that one person, that is a far more effective way to communicate your ideas. And you find people who aren't necessarily libertarians, who aren't necessarily freedom oriented, they do it all the time. They will tell the story about this one woman and bad things happen to her and that's why we need this law for everyone. And they win. And that's how they bring people over, by telling that one compelling story. Because we're humans, you know, and a lot of people are not like the people in this room. A lot of people in this room are very logic-driven and fact-driven and statistic-driven, and they're compelled by numbers. But unfortunately, that's just not the way the rest of the world works most of the time. You have to tell an emotionally compelling story. You have to tell a story about an individual. And you have to let people know why they should care. You have to tell a compelling case about why this is important and tell it from one person's point of view to get your, your point of view across. Did you want to... God damn it, you're eloquent. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, she said everything I really need to say about personal stories. Um, one of the things I like to be able to do is, uh, is walk the talk and so you, some of you may have... Uh, 
or my panel on uh, homeschooling, it's nice to actually be able to talk about libertarian ideas about things like homeschooling or unschooling and be able to kind of bring up, hey, no, I've done this, I've experienced this, and be able to speak from personal experience. Um, going into the personal uh, stories, or going deviating from that slightly, I wanted to bring up a, a debate tactic that is useful when, when dealing with personal stories, and that is the Ransberger pivot, which was developed by David Nolan Ray Ransberger in 1980. And it's a debate tactic to create allies because um because ideas flow between allies, they flow between friends, they don't flow between people fighting, people, people that are like head to head, oh no, I disagree with you on this subject. Um, and so a lot of times, one of the things I try to do when I'm talking to someone and we're having that debate and I'm talking statistics and they're talking personal stories, is I like to, to, to deal with the fact that they're coming at a, an idea, or they're coming at, you know, why, why do you want to, like, why, do you, why are you against universal health care? Because that's a big thing in the U.S. A lot of people are all about universal health care. And, um, and so they'll get mad because I'm saying, no, I, I don't believe in universal health care. And, uh, and at the end of the day, I, what I'm trying to do when I'm talking to them is I want to bring them to a point where they think that we're on the same side. And I'm hoping that we are in some context, which is we all want people to have access to healthcare. We just have different ways of wanting it to happen. And so when dealing with people's personal stories and when talking to people about, um, about an issue, to be able to listen to them and, and to say, oh, like we have the same value. The same value is, is, is affordable, accessible healthcare. We have different ways of wanting that to happen. And so if you can validate someone's desire for something, validate the fact that grandma needs health insurance, the elderly and the poor need health insurance, whatever, whatever the, the, the subject is, and you can validate the fact that you agree with that concept, you just want it in a different way, it puts you on the same side. And then the two of you are, instead of butting heads against each other, you are standing next to each other going, Going, how do we give everyone health care? How about we open up the market? And so this is this is the way that I deal with this, and I, I deal with this with people's personal stories all the time, is going, I really, like, I validate what you value, I care about these things, and now I want to show you how there's a different way to get them. So, And that leads us directly onto our next point. So the next tenet that we've come up with is know your audience. And it seems very basic, but you would be surprised how many people just will stand on their soapbox and it doesn't matter who they're speaking to, they just have their tirade that they say, and, um, and they don't actually stop to think about who the audience is, what values are important to them. Now, the thing about values is that everyone's a different. So when you're, you, I mean, something that's really important to me isn't necessarily going to be really important to everyone else in this room or particularly to people who aren't politically or philosophically aligned with me. So it's so important, as Arvins was saying, understand what's important to the person that, that you're talking about. Align yourself with them and then see if you can work from there. And what I found, I mean, I so working with John was such an incredible learning curve for me. I thought that I, I knew what I was talking about. I'd been a film producer, so I, um, and that's John Stossel. I'm, I'm not sure, in Australia, you, a lot of people might not know who that is. John is a, an amazing journalist in the United States. He was on 2020 for years and years and years and years. He's won 19 Emmys. He's a very well-known personality and he's a big libertarian. And he's, I, in my opinion, has done more for the freedom movement than anyone else that I can think of. And um, so working with him, I, he just taught me that lesson so hard, you know, know your audience, because I would come to him and say, here, I've got this great idea. You know, I'd like to do a segment on this, and it, it's great. And he would have to bring me back to the fact that it's a cable news show. Who, who is this for? You know, why would they be interested in that? And I'm thinking, well, what's interesting to me? You know, what do I want to see? And I was getting all self-indulgent and I'd do a thing about ending the Fed and, or, you know, whatever. And I'd go into jargon and I, I'd maybe do an expose on Austrian economics and say why it's awesome. Like, honestly, who on cable news is going to watch that? And he had to really just, <laughs> you will? Fantastic. Make, I'll make a show for you. Um, but who? I mean, if, if we're all self-indulgent and we just talk about the issues that are important to us, you end up in a room where everyone's just talking to themselves. So if you are really interested in communicating ideas and getting people over to your side and educating them, find out what's important to them. What are their values? They, you may not share them, but I can guarantee there's something in there that you share. There's some overlap between your, your thoughts. So find out what that is and build from there. Yeah, so she just made the point that was number one in my list, um, which is, uh, is, is definitely 
finding out what somebody values and being able to bring them from that point over to be able to say, you know, I, I, val- I agree with you on this thing. So a lot of times when I'm talking to friends who are Democrats in the U.S., most of them are totally cool with drugs, or like with, with weed at least and a lot of other drug legalization. And to be able to bring that from, of course, you have the right to put whatever you want into your body, and, and then to be able to move that into um, into criticizing the FDA and criticizing other, other forms of government regulation that make it harder for those things to happen. So knowing your audience and not just leading with the thing that's going to like piss them off, really. Um, <laughs> but the, I think the we other... like to be controversial, don't we? Well, Particularly and... this group, well, we like... <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And the thing is, is that, like, so I write for the Libertarian Republic is one of the, the places I write. And the Libertarian Republic has 1.5 million unique views every month. And most of those views are, I would say, a fairly conservative libertarian branch. And so I recognize that when I write about certain social issues, because I write about feminism and I write about, about abortion rights and I write about things that uh, conservatives aren't often very comfortable with, and I love to find ways to engage conservatives in, in, in being interested in in that, in, in opposing regulation and opposing and 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 uh, and allowing people to make economic decisions that they want to, so I, I find the ways to to know my audience and and bring things into them in, in the language that they're comfortable with. When I'm talking to leftists, I'm going to use language that you know a lot of libertarians. Go, I can't believe you used that word, but no, I used it because I need to speak the language of the people that I'm talking to. The second point I just want to make about knowing your audience is because most of my activism has been in. Facebook and dealing with people arguing on the internet. I definitely engage in all the comments that if somebody leaves a comment on one of my articles, I am going to engage back and forth and back and forth and it's going to be a blast. But, um, but one of the things that I have to remember is that, yes, I'm going to be arguing with someone, but the person that I'm arguing with is often invested in their perspective. Whatever it is that they want to say, whatever, whatever position that they hold, it's very, very hard for them as somebody who needs to save face, as somebody who needs to show, show up and represent what they're doing or what they believe in. They're very unlikely to just turn around and go, oh, you're totally right. Yeah, like that's not going to happen. People need to save face. People need to feel like, you know, they didn't just lose, like that. They don't, they don't like that. No one likes losing. And we love to go, oh, yeah, I totally, I totally got that guy. Smashed him on the internet. Right? Basically the, won the internet. But at the end of the day, that's not how, that's, that, that doesn't make people really want to open up to your ideas. It makes them actually close to them because then they have to defend themselves from what you believe is the truth. And so a lot of the things I do in debates is I try to engage people honestly. I try to... I try to have back and forth with someone and I recognize I'm not actually trying to convince the person that I'm talking to. Now I am trying to give them information, I'm trying to give them opportunities to learn something new and maybe, maybe they'll go, oh, well that's a really good point, I'll have to think about that. that, That's a win for me, I'll have to think about that, I'll get back to you on that. But the thing that really gets me is that there are a bunch of people watching that debate and they are not they are not commenting, they are not liking, they are not, they're just observing. And what they're observing is how I am interacting with that person, the information that I've given them, the links I've given them, the fact that I didn't call them like something horrible, like the, 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 the fact that I was just a human being going, no, I, I absolutely care about this issue and I think that you should too, and, 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 and I, that, I, that I treat them like a human being and I respect them. And that brings a lot of people to me going, Hey, I saw your argument with that guy, and I, I just, I really thank you for, like, the way you engaged with him made me really interested. Because my audience wasn't that guy, even though that's the person I was having the argument with. The audience was the person watching. So that's something to always be aware of. Yeah, and just on that note, I mean, we really do get bogged down with the idea of winning an argument. It's not the same thing as bringing people over to your side. So just keep that in mind and think what is your actual purpose in engaging with this person? Do you just want some sort of self-gratification and to know like, yeah, smashed him? Or do you actually want to enlighten people? Do you want to inform them? Because they're two completely different outcomes and completely different processes to get there. So just decide. You know, some people may just like winning. That's totally cool. Go and win and, and crush the internet. But if you're really passionate about ideas of liberty and you really do want this to become uh, people to become aware that freedom is is better it brings people out of poverty it's better for everything you need to learn how to engage people and winning the argument is not necessarily that way you know Um, the next point is keep it simple and this is so important 
we don't know when to stop. And I, it's, it's, I have this problem all the time, you know. If, if I win someone on, on step A, my initial reaction, I mean, I just immediately like, great, on to step B and then C and then D. And I just keep going until finally they've forgotten that they won, you know, step A. Now they're like, well, she totally lost step D, so I'm throwing out all of her arguments. Um, keep it simple. Know when to stop. And that's another really important lesson that I learned working with John, because when you're in network news, when you're in cable news, you're dealing with sound bites and someone is going to be clicking through channels and finding you and if you don't engage them and if it's not if if it's not clear if there's too much jargon they're just going to switch over and we have I mean we have so many so many metrics to back this up we we have all of our ratings after every show we know how many people are watching our show um, if only we had that in in real life I think if we could monitor how people are, are engaging with us in conversation we probably do it better and I think people don't realize that they make things too complicated and they try to cover too much ground and so often I mean I get carried away I do it all the time and I would write these these segments that it's like great let's talk about this theory we'll go from A to Z and uh, I'd, I'd take it to John and he'd be like I really like that initial first point and then he'd cross out the rest that I just painstakingly you know put all my effort into it but he's not convinced that that they actually get that first point. I'm trying to take them from A to Z, and he's like, let's just make sure they get A first. You know, whoa there. Uh, and that's just a really important lesson. We make so many presumptions about what people know and take for granted. So keep it simple, keep it small, and uh, and yeah, know when to stop. And don't, don't, don't keep going back and adding things to it and making things more complicated because it overwhelms people and they just shut down and it's just not helpful. Definitely. Um, and also a factor of that is simply the idea that you don't have to win it all in one day. You don't have to like bring someone from being a liberal Democrat to being like, uh, to, to suddenly being like, oh yeah, the non-aggression principle and I'm an anarchist now. Like that's not really, it's not going to happen in 30 minutes and it do, it's, it's, it's okay that it doesn't. Um, because being able to convince somebody about a libertarian solution on one topic and keeping it simple and keeping it as just, you know, a basic, you know, hey, people should have the freedom to, you know, spend money on whatever they want. That's, that's that's, a, that's just you know a nice open, and then and then people are then open to that future conversation in a future in a future time in which they do, they have time to digest that and then start like taking that thing that they just learned and start applying it to other things in their life, and then the work gets done for you. So you know I like that. Um, I'm actually going to use a personal anecdote for this for this little segment though is that um, so in the in the U.S. in Los Angeles we have Liberty on the Rocks, and I was out of Liberty on the Rocks one day, and I was. Um, there was a speaker, and th at the end of that, um, I went out for, over to the normal like bar area, and uh, there was just some dude waiting for his drink. And so he's just sitting there at the bar. I sat down next to him. I'm waiting for my drink, and he asked me what I was doing there at the bar. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm here for this kind of uh, political thing over there in the back room and uh and you know just didn't really want to get into it too much you know but but he was like oh is that that li um libertarian thing and I was like yeah yeah um you know I'm part of a political group or libertarians and he's like yeah I am not really interested in politics and I was like oh you know, that's fine like why not and, you know, and this is just bar conversation, right? I was just like, well, why are you not interested in politics? And he's like, well, it's just politicians are all liars and the government's corrupt. And it's just like, why, like, why would I want to be involved in politics? And I looked at him and I was like, oh, so you're already a libertarian. <laughs> like, and, and I mean, sure, like if we had a conversation about policy, probably not a libertarian. However... The, like that was the conversation that made it funny we're just you know like suddenly he's like let me buy you a drink and let's talk about this more and suddenly we're able to have a conversation about things and I get to ask him what he what he, how he feels about certain things and I start to chip away at things that he thinks the state are necessary for but I kept it simple oh you're already a libertarian you think that the government's corrupt perfect we're already we're already like halfway there because we're good and and that's the thing is that he then friended me on Facebook, and now he engages in all my Facebook posts. He's not totally a libertarian yet, but he's being exposed to ideas he wouldn't have previously. So I always try to keep it like simple, and also give yourself little wins. Give yourself those moments of letting people just just playfully be like, "Oh no, look at that! We're already on the same side. We agree." So, and the last point I think is the most important point. Would you agree? I think yes. Nick Gillespie touched on it very briefly last night. 
Um, don't be an asshole. It is so important, you know? And it brings us back to what we've been talking about um, through the whole, whole talk. It, we're so, you know, we just focus on winning and we think that shutting people down, you know, maybe they'll be embarrassed into enlightenment. Maybe that's a thing. So like it just, it doesn't work that way. You know, if you open a conversation by saying, you're an idiot. Like, well, you, you've kind of lost already, right? So, um, and, and I, I know a lot of people who are very smart, very smart people, and yet they still don't get this point. And they think that maybe they can just humiliate people into realizing the folly of their point of view. But what's actually happening? I mean, if you're an asshole, if you're too aggressive, if you, you know, it, it, shutting people down and saying they just don't understand this issue, what you're essentially doing is you're putting up their defensive mechanisms. You know, when our brain goes into fight or flight mode, it doesn't function well. It can't absorb these ideas well. What you want is for their defenses to go down, for them to have an open mind, and it's what Arvins has been saying, bring them over to your side. You need to do that. Um, and it's just so important. And also, back to what you were saying before, I think it is so important. Sometimes the audience for these conversations is not the person you're having the conversation with. And always remember that. Because if you want to be a role model for these points of view, you need to be that person Person. And that person is not someone who's really arrogant and aggressive and shutting people down and nasty. That person is someone who can, you know, have intelligent conversations with people, who can listen to their point of view, who can not shut them down but actually engage, actively see where they're coming from, understand their point of view. And it's just, yeah, it's just so important. I, I think that it's the most important yes. of all of them. <laughs> So um, as uh, my, my subtitle under uh, don't be an asshole is really uh, is is um, simply also be a goddamn human being. And what I mean by this is I'm going to take another example from a Facebook thread debate that I had been witnessing. And this is actually a perfect example for the Ransberger pivot where we're having a conversation between uh, two people. We've got a Democrat who believes in universal health care and you've got a libertarian who doesn't. And, uh, and I watched this actual debate happen in which they're going back and forth about how important it is for the government to provide health care for people. And the Democrat then said, my grandmother has cancer and she doesn't have health insurance and she's going to die because, you know, you stupid libertarians won't just let there be universal health care. And the guy, the, the, the libertarian who was, was answering, it's one of those moments when you really wish the guy wasn't on your side. His response was, you don't get to put a gun to my head and make me pay for your grandmother's health care. When the appropriate response to my grandmother has cancer and she doesn't have health insurance and she's going to die because of you is, oh my God, your grandmother has health, has, has cancer? Oh my, are you, are, what's going on? Like, how's, how far is it? Oh my goodness. Like, you know, I'm so sorry to hear that. And like, be a goddamn human being. Like, I'm so sorry your grandmother has cancer. Like, she lost her health insurance? Was it be, did her premiums go up? Oh my God, see this is the problem is we're fighting against ra rising premiums in the US because, because of regulations, because there, unfortunately it's not a free market and there, it's harder and harder for people to get health insurance. There we go, we're now on the same side, we're having a conversation about poor grandma and how we get her health care and why libertarianism is going to do that better than st status universal health care. And, and it was just, it was so hard to watch. I was like, oh my God, God, stop talking when the guy when the guy was going on because I'm like for a minute let's just let's just be humans and go hey I'm really sorry about your grandma <laughs> so don't be an asshole <laughs> and um, on that note so the flip side of that is be the person that you would want to emulate you know I find a lot of the time people just don't think about these ideas so if you are someone to broach these topics and talk about certain things someone's never even really contemplated before. You could be the person to bring them over to your side or you could be the person to repel them forever. So be really careful with that. There's one, there's a band that I um, I, I like to plug. I um, I discovered them via the internet. I don't, don't know any of them. It's called the Free Noughts. And what I really like about them is they're using art as a way to make these ideas sexy. And you know I think about that them is... because they made a song about you, right? Yeah, I discovered yeah, yeah, them because yeah. they put me in a song and I was like I love you so I'm a bit biased but then I checked out their other music and I love that even more so they made this this song it's called like sexy rebel something I, 
uh, it has a sexy name we all it like. has a really sexy name but basically like I listened to this song and they were describing um, you know oh, this girl that you know they love and and um, you know she's cool and she's radical and you know um, she's she's dangerous and all of these things and I was thinking like wow you know if a young impressionable woman is listening to that and she wants to to create herself like create someone create a personality you know they might be inspired by something like that you know some and they're talking about freedom you know she believes in freedom she believes in helping people all of this stuff but they made it really sexy and I thought that's that's really clever using art as a way to uh, show these ideas as sexy is something else really great that you can do and also yourself just being a role model for these ideas being a good person being someone who actively engages and helps and and and, uh, is intelligent, is well informed. Uh, I think that's all just really important. I think one of the last points that should be made is that sometimes like, we all have these. I think all four of these points would apply to anyone in this room uh, when dealing with other people. But I think another aspect is that sometimes you're not the right person to talk to someone about an issue, and that's okay too. But it's it's good to you know like it's like that kind of knowing when to quit when you're ahead. Like you know bring up that that nice like little point. You know keep it simple. Get someone a little bit friendly to libertarianism, and then go hey maybe you're a rampant feminist and I'm not really good at talking to feminists. Maybe you should talk to Ovens O'Brien. And to get to know your own libertarian community and to be able to turn, like, send people towards people that they might learn something from who are able to speak their language. I'm not asking every single person in this room to be able to talk to every single kind of person out there, but to know how to go, hey, you know what? I have a really great person that you should totally follow. They have a great blog, they have a great website, they have a great Facebook page, and to be able and I mean, this is what my friends do all the time to me is they go, hey, just so you know, I sent some friends over your way because you can talk to them better than I can. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that and to say, hey, this person much better on this issue than I am. And I want you to learn from the best. Ooh. And I believe we have some questions. We've got five or six minutes for them. Um, oh. I think you can just use the mic that's up there. Right? I, I think that's the... Just use the mic that's on the stand for you. Um, Lee has a uh, question for Naomi. <laughs> this is not a good way to spread libertarianism with feedback. <laughs> what advice would you give for people who want to communicate through media, high YouTube channels or radio shows? Where is a good place to start learning a bit more sophisticated texts for, for producing media? Uh, what advice would you give to people who want to communicate through media, i.e. via YouTube or via radio shows? What What are the good places to learn more sophisticated techniques? Um, so that is so loud. Um, so we live in an amazing age. It is the ma the age of technological democratization and media democratization and we all have incredible HD cameras in our phones and we all have access to free editing software and we all have computers and we I mean it's incredible what you can do now no one has any excuse for not be creating things and putting it out there so if people want to know you know how to create things I, I would say first of all create as much content as you can uh, just keep creating and refining your process and you'll get better and better at messaging through that. Um, I do encourage everyone to find some sort of artistic avenue for spreading ideas because there, there are so many different things you can do, even creating memes. If you don't like working a camera, great. Create some memes, send them out there. That's always nice. That grabs attention. Um, write a song, uh, draw a picture, do something that that um, that sends people uh, people's awareness. And what's great about this current age is that social media is our distributor. And it didn't used to be the case. We used to have a, like gatekeepers who would cut you out, there were huge barriers to entry and we couldn't enter the industry. You know, 10 years ago, you couldn't enter the industry. That is just not the case anymore. You can get your content out to millions of eyeballs and that is huge. And I think everyone in this room should be taking advantage of that. And does that help answer the question? I'm sure it does. Lee. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Maureen has a, a very good question. Five years ago when this organization, organization began, <coughs> The question was raised as to why the freedom movement had so few women in it. Today it's wonderful to hear and see two charming, articulate young women who engage more and teach us how. How do we get more? 
<laughs> so one thing I'd like to point out, and I have no idea what the actual um, uh, ratio is here in, in Australia. Uh, in the U.S., we're at a point where uh, something like the Libertarian Republic, which I, I write for, 1.5 million unique views a month, uh, 40% of its viewers or its readers are women. <coughs> And that's great. Like forty percent of its viewers are women, and um, and actually in most American news sources, uh, there's a slight ratio higher male readership. So it's actually pretty close to like a mainstream source. Um, and I think that one, I think that there are actually more female libertarians out there. They just maybe shy away from conferences, and maybe. Judd Weiss can help take prettier pictures and we can all want to go. Um, <laughs> they may actually shy away from confrontation it, as it, well. That's, that's another thing is that I have actually, I was just on a podcast about this the other day, is, uh, is I've, I've watched a lot of times is that like a woman will come into, I, I bring like friends into libertarian events like, a, like Liberty on the Rocks and stuff and I, I often encounter a lot of, of sudden confrontation about like, People who are kind of on the fence, and women are like women and men are often totally on the fence about libertarianism. But when you bring in like a woman, inevitably, like someone's gonna come on and be like, "Well, are you like a feminist or something?" Or are you? And they they get like confrontational about things when maybe they're totally with us on the drug war and like and and other subjects, but they're not quite there on other things. And and I watch people just kind of scare them off, and they don't like that. And, and uh, people don't like confrontation in general. But I think that. Um, I think that one, uh, seeing more women in the liberty movement, which has been growing substantially, like the, the women in the liberty movement 20 years ago when I was doing LP activism versus, um, or 15 years ago when I was doing a lot of LP activism to now, um, I've definitely seen an increase already. And so I think that the more representation we have, the more we're going to see women drawn into the movement. Um, but I think uh, I think there's a lot that we can do to just just be less confrontational and and I I don't know I I work for Liber Ladies of Liberty Alliance and I think that one of the things we try to do is is reach out to to women and bring in women female leadership within the liberty movement which will help boost the uh, the number of women in the movement yeah I would also add I mean it's okay for men and women to be interested in different things as well um, but that being said if you have a movement that is primarily men maybe that might deter some women who otherwise would join it from joining. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and I think that going back to our, our second point we raised, know your audience is really important. And a lot of the time you find with women is that, like, I, I know so many men who prefer a good argument over, you know, the women who do. I find that, I mean, I'm making a vast generalisation here, but um, especially, like, a lot of my friends can be very passive-aggressive with these topics. They don't like outward confrontation, but they're not comfortable with ideas. That's a prime example of knowing your audience, finding a way to connect with them first, and just don't scare them off right off the bat. Last thing is, by the way, could please people stop saying that women have a biological inclination to like the state because I'm fucking tired of that. <laughs> like, because, because if you want to say that, men have a fucking biological desire to be aggressive and dominant and so they shouldn't like liberty either. So like, stop, stop doing that. If any of you ever, ever seen someone do that, I've seen people say that to women. Like, oh, well, like, I mean, it's great. I mean, you have this biological need for like a father fit or like a, a man you to like take care people of you to control you like you. the state. Yeah. Like, screw that. And I'm can't so make tired of people saying that. So please, please stop saying that. If you've ever seen someone say that, slap them in the face. Sorry. Non-aggression principle. Don't yeah. do that. Don't do that. Great. Right. There's, there's my, there's my like non-aggression principle. No, no. <laughs> Probably got time for one more quick one, and it's kind of related. It's an equally important demographic. Uh, Kyle Williams asks: Is there any specific advice in how you would approach a discussion in a class with uni students, or is it more or less the basic same principles? Universities are hard. They're hard because there's such a climate right now of shutting down discussion. It's difficult. I've, I've spoken at a high school in uh, in Brooklyn many times, and um, and there it's different there. It's, I think that high schools you're still they're, they're you know they're kind of like lemmings. They're there with open ears, and you tell them what to do. I don't really like the schooling system. I don't think it's the best way for children to learn. But um, they you can at least discuss things there. And then in universities, it's 
it's really difficult. Um, I, again, just think that you need to know your audience. You need to really find ways to connect because as soon as you get confrontational, then you have people crying wolf and saying, you offended me and getting charged. What is it? I just heard the Murdoch people say that at Murdoch they get charged $50 on campus if they offend someone and it's the aggressor who gets to put that claim forward. You you offended me. I get 50, you, know, I, you get charged 50 bucks. Like that, that's scary for me. So you know what? If, if that's what it takes, try not to offend people. Try to get on their side. Try to find out how to connect with them and to convey these ideas. Um, and you shouldn't have to tread on tiptoes. You shouldn't have to walk on eggshells. But that is what we're dealing with now. So you just have to figure out a way to still get these ideas across and still engage people. I mean, I definitely see... What's interesting is uh, Berkeley College in, in, in the US, at the, what, in the 60s, it was the birth of the free speech movement. And now it's like, now they're just shutting down people. And it's crazy. But um, somebody, somebody that I really love following on, on Facebook, uh, Adam Bates, had said something about how like there's been a little bit... There's been a lot of antagonism of leftists, and, and I don't mind occasionally antagonizing leftists, let's be perfectly honest. But, but, um, but I do dislike like the fact that free speech has become this conversation like obviously we we have free speech not so we can talk about the weather but so that we can say things that may be offensive or maybe or, or maybe uh, challenging the status quo but I do think it's it's annoying when our free speech advocates are saying things that aren't just offensive but are actually just really obnoxious and really turn people off and so when we deal with with college campuses we've got the the student groups that bring in uh, speakers and I'm actually a friend of Milo Yiannopoulos so like I, I you know I'll, I'll shit on him a little bit sometimes but I, I actually like we're friends but um but the fact is, is that when when the controversial speakers we bring in are always the controversial speakers that that say things about race realism or about or about or about things that um, or, or anti transgender stuff or whatever else. I mean, they have the right to speak. But I think that it'd be interesting to see us bringing in other controversial ideas that leftists might be a little bit friendlier towards, and to see what would happen if uh, if if there was a new conversation, if there was new opportunities for them to be wanting to defend this free speech against, let's say, the right-wingers on their campus. And so I, I, when it comes to university students, I love SFL, I love uh, um, Young Americans for Liberty and their groups and what they're doing on college campuses. And uh, I think ultimately, I think we need to hold hands and be nice to people to, to some degree. And yes, every once in a while, we're gonna agitate them. I do that on Facebook all the time. Just, you know, at the end of the day, be kind and be human. Yeah, and also seek out organizations that protect people on campuses. I know in the United States, Fire. there's FIRE, um, Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, and it's a great organization. And anytime someone is within their constitutional rights and is freely speaking and they get shut down or persecuted on the campus, this group will come in and, and protect them. I'm just wondering if, if a Australia has um, has something like that, and if not, maybe there are some entrepreneurial people in this room who might start something like that, who have a background in law, who can protect people's uh, speech. I think that's a really important thing, an important service to provide. Well, we feel very privileged to have both of you guys down here, and I do hope you can return maybe next year and the year after, and yet again. So please, please join me with thanking. Uh, Um, look, thank you everyone. We are now all looking forward to the gala dinner. So just brief housekeeping. If everyone, if everyone can please and try and leave here as quickly as possible because we do need to transform this entire area into a formal dinner function. So if everyone could please, no, like don't stay to talk and so forth. I know a lot of people go, need to go and get changed, etc. The dinner starts at seven o'clock. The exception is if you are, um, if you are here for the, uh, the VIP pre-dinner drinks. Um, you would have probably received an email invitation to it if you thought you should have received one and you didn't, let me know. Um, but if you'll go to the VIP drinks, they are, start they are starting now. Once again, I recognise a lot of people are going to be ducking off, getting changed and so forth. But they are starting now and they are next door in, just in that room in the Liberty Lounge. So I will either see you now at some, if you're, or I will see, look forward to seeing you all at seven for our gala dinner with Grove and Yay.